everybody. Welcome back. CS125. <laughs> so this morning, one of the first things we're going to do is I have a couple representatives from the student groups here that are going to talk to you a little bit about the rest of your life here on campus, the stuff you're going to do outside of CS125, the things that you're going to do that are going to bring meaning and joy and are going to expose you to all sorts of new cool stuff. So I just want to tell you something. I was interviewing here about you know a year and a half ago. So I came here a year ago. I had a couple of other job offers at you know more prestigious institutions and other places. But when I visited Illinois, there were two things I noticed here that really made an impression on me and that were influential in my decision to come here and teach this class. The first thing is, when I walked into Siebel, how many people have been to Siebel? All right. Our, our, well, first of all, Siebel exists, so that had made an impression on me, this huge <laughs> temple of computer science. But when I walked in, one of the things I found right on the ground floor was an enormous space devoted to the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM. So this department has made a huge bet on our ACM chapter. We devote resources to it. How many people have noticed this already? The ACM chapter, like right when you come in the building, it's the first thing. There are other universities that give the ACM like a tiny little closet type office somewhere. We don't do that. We have a huge suite for them. I don't know what they do in there, um, <laughs> but they have an enormous amount of space and that's a representation of the department's you know, belief that this is an important part of your experience. So that was the first thing. The second thing I noticed that really excited me was this department really recently won an award for increasing female participation in computer science. How many people knew that? $100,000, actually, a couple of years ago. So that was something else that was really important to me. And there are groups here, if you are a woman or you are a minority and you feel a little bit underrepresented in computer science, but really those groups are for all of us because this is a big crisis that's affecting our field and making it more, you know, uh, making our field more open and more encouraging to people from all walks of life is something that's gonna fundamentally make it stronger and more vibrant for everybody. So regardless of whether or not you're in one of those groups, this is something that you should care about and something you should get involved with while you're here on campus. Okay, I've talked enough. Uh, let me introduce the representatives from our, our student groups. Come right down here. <laughs> and I need to actually cast this for them, don't I? Uh -oh. um, so let's introduce ourselves. Uh, my name's Kyle Begovich. I am from ACM, Hack Illinois, and a bunch of other student groups here. Um, I'm Shivali Patel. Um, I'll be talking about WCS and RP. Uh, excellent. So we're going to start off with Hack Illinois. So Hack Illinois is the premier open source software and hackathon that happens every February. We're in the planning stages right now, and we're looking to get more people involved in staff. We're really excited every time new students come to campus because you guys have the new ideas, the exciting things that will engage students, and we're really looking forward to having your input on the staff. Um, as we start that onboarding process. That'll be over the next few weeks. You'll hear more about the action items, you know, where to go get involved in that Thursday during ACM Open House. Um, and if you haven't heard about Reflections and Projections, it's a completely student-run tech conference that we host in the fall, um, uh, hosted by ACM. I was the director last year, so if you find me on campus and have questions, feel free to reach out. But these are the dates for it upcoming. There's two career fairs and then a whole bunch of amazing speakers happening at the end of the week um, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and it's one of the pride and joys of our department, in my opinion, at least. So feel free to check out the website. You can volunteer for it this year, and then later in the semester, they'll have staff applications if you want to be part of running it for next year. Um, and women in computer science. So I'm the president this year, um, and for you guys to know, I want you to make sure you note down the room number, 1318 Siebel Center. Starting from next week, we'll have um, our door mostly open during the afternoons, uh, every business, every weekday during business hours. Um, feel free to come by and you know hang out with us, study in there, talk to upperclassmen and officers just about life, love, classes, whatever it is. Uh, we try to do a lot of different um, outreach events, mentoring, socials, we try to like hit it all. There's corporate tech talks, et cetera. Um, and you can learn more at ACM Open House about us too. Um, we also have Hack for Impact, which is our um, social good um, developing team. They work directly with clients um, to actually build software that benefits nonprofits. 
They work on web and data science, and it's a very close-knit community to provide mentorship and work with the people that are doing this nonprofit good. And since we know how to do software and we can really help these people, um, I really encourage you to get involved with that. And then ACM, as Jeff mentioned, we are the Association for Computing Machinery. Um, we're doing a bunch of Welcome Week events. Uh, today, actually, we're doing a boba run uh, to Latie down, uh, down in Campus Town. Um, and then Thursday, we have our ACM Open House, which is where you can hear about our special interest groups. So if you're interested in something like virtual reality, machine learning, data science, we have groups for those, uh, for those people interested in that. And you can hear more about them and meet those people directly Thursday night with free pizza in the Siebel Center. Um, cool. All right. Thank you for the time, guys. So again, one of the, the really exciting opportunities you have here at the University of Illinois is to, is to get involved with these groups. So there's just a limit to what we can do in this class. We will do as much as we can this semester, but there are so many cool things about computer science that I just don't have time to teach you. And one of the best ways to learn here and to become a part of this community on campus is to show up for events like this. One of the things I wanna say now, and I will probably try to repeat as many times as possible, um, Many people, how many people in here were, were good at high school? No, 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 all your hands should be up, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you guys are the people that, that did well in high school, right? Like, that's this group. You guys got good grades, you know, you were in lots of activities, you got good grades, you got good grades. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons that you're here at the University of Illinois. At this point, it becomes important that you find other ways to learn things outside of your classes. It is, you know, if, if, let's say the following happened. Let's say you got involved in the ACM this semester and you got an A minus in CS125. That would be a great outcome. That would be better than getting an A in CS125 and never going to a hackathon, never getting involved with a student group, never, you know, finding ways to meet your peers and learn all the cool stuff that we're not gonna be able to do in this class. So particularly this fall, as you're freshmen and you're adjusting to college, many of you for the first time, you know, think about making sure that you get involved with these groups. There's like a bus that leaves Illinois pretty much every other weekend that goes to some sort of hackathon at another university and you can be on that bus. Maybe you won't finish the MP for that week, that's okay. These experiences are the things that are really gonna define you know, what you learn in college. We're gonna do as much as we can in this class, but all of these wraparound activities are super important. So don't get so concerned with your performance here that you miss out on this stuff, because this stuff, you know, college goes fast. You know, I'm sure if you talk to Kyle and Chevali, they'll tell you that they feel like just yesterday they were sitting here as freshmen. So this is your time to take advantage of these things. All right, so we're back to Java today, and I just wanna point out, you know, particularly for those of you that are new, and have never written code before, um, this is in many ways similar to learning a new language. It's equally frustrating. So if I airdropped you into the middle of, you know, Germany, and you were suddenly forced, my wife was an exchange student in Denmark, um, and she was living on a small island, and everybody there was very encouraging of her to learn Danish, um, which is a language that not very many people speak outside of Denmark, but which the Danes are very proud of. And so she had this story where there was a bus driver, and every day she would get on a bus to go to the school, and he would insist that she speak Danish to him. And she actually thought that he did not speak English. So this went on for like nine months. And then one of the last days she was there, he greeted her in English, and they had this long conversation in English together. So the whole time he had been sort of forcing her to pick up this, and this is very similar to what we're doing to you here with Java if you've never learned this before. Now, as far as learning a new language, Computers have one big advantage and one huge drawback. So the big advantage is they never get tired of talking to you. If you, you know, try to learn a human language and you're sputtering and you're not making any sense, at some point your friend who speaks it is gonna be like, I'm, I'm tired of this, you know, this is not very much fun. The computer will never get tired of you. Um, it will sit there and you can try and try and try again to communicate with it. And if it's confused, it'll tell you if it's confused, um, but when you get it right, you know, you'll have a great feeling. The bad thing is, computers are very easy to confuse, and they're very literal. So let me show you an example. 
So this looks like one of the examples that we used last time in class. I'm printing a message to the console, right? And, you know, if you haven't done this for a while, this might look correct. Looks pretty good, right? So let's try running it and see what happens. Uh-oh. Yeah, so here's this incredibly helpful error message from the computer. The computer says, compiler error, line break in literal not allowed. Hmm. Even I struggle sometimes to interpret these arcane mutterings of the machine. Does anyone know what's wrong? Yeah, anybody, just yell it out. Yeah, right over here. And again, until you've done this for a while, you're gonna have to look hard for these kind of things. So I open my string literal with a double quote, but I close it with a single quote. And so this small change, now it works. So I frequently hear from students that take this class that are like, I almost got the MP right. I just, I was off by one character. But being off by one character for a computer is like a huge difference. I once in college spent two days debugging a problem with my code that, once I found it, consisted of swapping two characters, literally. Like two days, very little sleep, and that was the problem. So just because it's a small change to the text of your code that fixes the problem doesn't mean that was, you were actually close to the solution, because I was actually several days away from the solution. All right. So here's how we're gonna approach teaching you this new language this semester. We're gonna do what, you know, people do when they know the language. We're gonna start off with small pieces. So for the first couple weeks, we're gonna be looking at single lines of code, and then three or four lines of code. Um, and then we're gonna start working up to slightly more complicated examples. You're gonna see this happening with the homework. The homeworks may seem extremely easy right now, but they're gonna get a little bit harder every day. And by the time we're at the end of the semester, you're gonna be writing some pretty sophisticated pieces of code. Uh, there, was, there was one student who posted on the forum who accidentally found our homework problems from last semester and like freaked out. They were like, this homework is way too hard. And I'm like, yeah, because you're looking at the end of semester homework from last semester. So, so relax, we'll get there, right? But we're a long way uh, from there now. Then we'll start looking at little bigger chunks. So we'll start looking at a whole function, a routine that the computer can execute over and over again. Those frequently implement algorithms, problem-solving strategies that embody how computers actually approach and solve problems. And then eventually, my goal by the end of this semester, and there'll be times when we have to take some minor digressions to get you there, but my goal is to get you to the point where you can understand a complete file of Java source code. So this, there's a lot to it. This is a modern and very mature language. But by the time we're done, you should be able to go on the internet, find a file of Java code, and puzzle your way through it. You may not understand everything about how it works. I don't always understand how things work after reading one file. Sometimes I have to spend some time looking around. But that's our goal. That's where we're going. Okay. So today we're gonna, for the next couple of days, we're going to anchor our discussions in these things that we talked about last time that computers were good at. And today we're gonna focus on math and storing data. So fundamental to the way that we're gonna be programming in this class is an idea of a variable. A variable is, you can think of a variable as sort of like a container that I can put a value into. It will store that value. I can change the value as the program runs. In Java, in order to tell the computer that I want to use a particular variable, I declare it. This is something that's called a variable declaration. This is the first statement of Java code that we're going to look at. So here's some examples. And I put comments there to sort of uh, illustrate the kind of way that you might think about this when you read code. So when you're getting started, particularly when you're a beginner, it's helpful to learn to sort of talk your way through this. So if you were talking your way through this code, you would say, okay, on line two, I'm declaring a variable called C of type car. We're gonna talk about exactly what this means in a minute. Um, okay, on line five, I've got something called first, and it's of type int. On line seven, you know, I'm creating a new Boolean variable, and I'm gonna call it is set. So in Java, the variable name is at the right side of my variable declaration, and the type is at the left side. 
that's a little unintuitive, because the way you read it is kind of from right to left. So when I read it, I say, I have a variable named C of type char. The way it's actually declared is with the type first, the variable name second. In Java, every t variable has to be assigned a name and a type. This is not true of every programming language, and you will learn programming languages later in your life that don't have this rule. Generally, you have to have a name for a variable, but not every programming language is as strict about the type. The name is for you. The computer doesn't know or care by the time your code is run about the names you give to variables. Those are only for your convenience. The, it, by the time the computer runs your code, it has no idea that you called that particular character C. It doesn't care. All of that information has been scrubbed away. So the names are entirely for your use as a programmer. And naming variables properly is one of the things I think is an underappreciated skill, particularly when you're getting started programming. Picking good variable names will make it way easier for you to understand the code that you're writing. The type in Java is both for you and for Java itself. So the type, Java's type system is designed to allow you to program more safely. It makes sure that you're putting a particular value into a container that belongs there. And this is designed to help you write uh, code that's correct. So Java is gonna help you with the types. It's gonna enforce rules about what kind of thing I can put in these different containers. So in general, as you would expect, variable names have to be unique. And there are rules about what we call scope, and we will come back to those later. But for now, the idea is that when the code is run, the computer needs to be able to know what you meant when you said, I want to use particular variable C. So here, on line two, I declare a variable C, and say, so the computer's like, okay, you know, they, they, they want this particular type of container that you can put a character into, that's great. And then on line six, um, I'm, I'm trying to declare another variable called C. And at this point, the computer is not going to compile or run this code, and it's gonna say, you can't do this, because now I'm confused. When you say C, do you mean something that has type int, or do you mean something that has type car, or, or holds a character? Even if you try to redeclare a variable, the, the computer is still going to complain. This is still going to be an error. This is typically a problem in your logic. You can change the value of variables. That's why they're called variables. But you can't redeclare the same variable in Java twice. So like I said, choosing good variable names will make your life a lot easier. I know this is something that people tend to not do. A lot of the student code I see, even from people who think they know how to program in this class and have been programming since they were 10, has terrible variable names. It's like the first variable name I'll call A, and then the next one I'll call B, and then I've already got a B, so now I'm on to C, right? By the time you get down 10 lines later, and you're like, what is B for again? What is F for? What was my, what was the point of variable H? There's an assignment in this class I was helping students debug last year. There's a particular assignment we're gonna get to later that forces you to work with a coordinate system. And I actually was working with some students that had chosen the variable y to represent the x coordinate, and had chosen the variable x to represent the y coordinate. And I was so confused. I told them the first thing you have to do is go through and fix all of these names, because you're never going to understand your own code. Every time you look at it, it's like, oh wait, when I say x, I meant y. Or did I, right? Anyway, so good variable names are descriptive. They say something about what the variable does, how it's being used in your code. So when you see it later, you have some sense of, what was the point of this variable? Why, why did I declare it, and what is it for? What role is it playing in my program? Indicative of the variable's function, that goes along with being descriptive, and as succinct as possible. But, remember, characters are free. Except you have to type them. The computer does not care about how long your variable names are. So, in general, I would err on the side of descriptive. I was thinking about this this morning, and I wanted to make sure, and, and I could show you hundreds of examples of my own code, um, both in Java and other languages, and, and show you sort of how I've chosen variable names. But I, I have a tendency to choose incredibly long variable names, extremely descriptive ones, 
It does mean I have to do a little bit more typing, but trust me, it pays off in the long run because you know what the variable does. So this is, I'm trying to remember what this is from. Oh, this is from the MP0 solution set. So now you have like a three lines of code from our solution set for the first MP. Um, and, and I'm not expecting you to understand this yet, but I just want you to see that I've chosen, um, you know, these variables aren't declared within this scope, but I have a variable called starting point. I have a variable called doubles that stores an array of type doubles. Uh, I have a variable called maximum. You have no idea what this code is doing. I'm showing you a snippet from a much longer piece of code, but even without any context, you could probably guess a little bit about what role these variables are playing in this particular algorithm. And that's the, that's the reason to choose good variable names is that when you are debugging and you're looking at just at this piece of code, you don't have to continually remind yourself what, what is B doing here, right? What's the role of my variable B? All right. So let me briefly talk about comments. Another piece of programming practice that is something that, that people aren't necessarily using properly when they get started. So in Java, you can write a comment in your code. What does that mean? It means that this is a, uh, some text that is completely ignored by the computer. It is only there for your benefit. You can write single line comments using two slashes to start it, and then you can write whatever you want. So one of the questions we get frequently in this class is like, what's the point of comments? Because they're ignored by the computer, why would I ever write them? Because you read your own code. So if you write a comment that helps you understand why you did something, the next day after you've slept a little bit, and you're still 10 points from getting 100 on the MP, you will remember why is this weird piece of code here. It can also be very helpful when you start writing small programs to write down in comments what you're trying to do. So before you write a single line of code, write down your approach, write down your algorithm, just in text. And then you start going through and you fill in the implementation of that algorithm. This is something that the CAs are, I'm gonna tell the CAs, to really insist that you guys do, because frequently what happens is that people come into office hours with a huge blob of code, and the CA has no idea what you're trying to do. So if you at least have written down, here's what I was trying to accomplish, then we can talk about flaws in your logic, if there are some, um, and distinguish those from flaws in your implementation. Because sometimes you have a perfectly working solution, it just doesn't solve the problem. Um, and so that's very, that can be very frustrating. All right. So in Java, there are eight special types that are known as primitive types. So remember, every variable has a name and a type. The type tells me something about what kind of variable it is. And, and in Java, every single data structure, every single more complicated type is built on top of these eight primitive types. And you can really break them into four categories. There are types that store integers. An integer is a number without a decimal point. One, two, 10, 65,000. Java has four different types that store integers. We'll talk about why in a minute. I have floating point numbers. So a floating point number is a number with a decimal point. 1.2, pi, 5.6. Um, Java, again, has two different types that store floating point data. And again, we'll talk about why this is in a minute. I can store character values. I have one type for that, it's called car. And then I can store truth values. So this is an important part of programming once we start using conditional logic. So frequently your program is gonna either do one thing or either do something else, and these type of Booleans can help you make that decision. So the Boolean type has only two values. Pretty much every one in, of these other types has, have many values, potentially, but Booleans take two values true or false. So this is the point in the class where we really start talking about data. This is why Java has these primitive types. And you can start to think. So you might think about, we'll talk about this more as we go on. If I only have these types, I can only store integers, floating point numbers, characters, and truth values, how do I represent a video? How do I represent somebody's CAT scan? How do I represent a string, text? How do 
I represent, you know, how does a self-driving car represent the world around it, right? What it knows about the universe. All of this is done using these eight primitive types, or equivalent in other languages. In order for computers to manipulate information, we have to be able to store it in one of these. Now, it's not usually stored in one of these. It's not like a self-driving car has a single int that it uses to represent the state around it. That would be a very bad self-driving car, right? I would hope that nobody would put that car on the road, but, you know, you wouldn't put it past some of the companies out there today. Um, so usually what we have is we have a bunch of these. So for example, photo consists of a bunch of different numbers. A string consists of a bunch of different characters arranged in a particular way. But at the bottom, at the base, Everything is stored in one of these simple types. So, you know, if you're ever getting confused about how we represent things in a computer, just remember that it all boils down to this. Everything in Java, any object that we talk about later, any complicated data structure can be reduced down to series, just a, a, a set, a group of these very, very small building blocks. Okay. When I declare a variable, so now you can start to recognize these types. So these are some of the primitive types that we just talked about. You can see on line three I have a variable called mine that's of type float. When I declare a variable, I also have an opportunity in Java to initialize it, to set the first value that it's gonna take. So on line three, I'm creating a variable called mine, and I'm initializing it to the value 0 0.1. This is a floating point value, and so I can store there's a floating point type, and so I can store a floating point value inside of it. That's fine. On line six, I have a Boolean. Is it snowing? It's equal to false. Um, that's a holdover from when I was teaching this class last February, but it's still not snowing, so that's good. If it was snowing in August, you guys would be in for a rough winter. Um, and then time since 1979, I can represent numbers, right? So one of the, you know, another thing you might think of is how do we represent time in a computer? One of the ways we do that is as a number. So for some reason, it's, has anyone heard of this before? This is another one of these things that we refer to as conventions in computer science. So in many cases, computers store time as a single number. And it's milliseconds since a particular point in time. Does anyone know when that point is? Yeah. Yep. January 1st, 1970. It's known as the Unix epoch. So that's like around the first time that people were building the first computer systems. Uh, there's an operating system that's still uh, in wide use today and is sort of the basis or the inspiration for systems like Linux called Unix. So this is known as the Unix era. We actually have a whole, I mean, when, when um, anthropologists look back on our society in like 10,000 years, assuming that we make it 10,000 years, um, they'll be like, oh, th there's this particular point in time, the Unix epoch that started at 1970, right? January 1st, 1970. Um, so that's, that's th this is a convention, but this is how uh, many computers store time. All right, so let's, let's pull up this next example. So one of the things we're gonna do more and more in class as the semester goes on is I'm gonna ask you guys to actually interact with these examples. So pull this up, um, and let's, you know, if, so if I try to run this right now, I'm gonna, you know, the, the compiler is gonna complain because I haven't initialized X and I need to do that before I can print it. So let's try initializing that to something. You can put whatever you want in there. Oh. Ah, sorry. It's my fault. So let's change the type of this variable to double. It's the first thing you have to do to correct my bad example. And then let's initialize it to a floating point value. If you want to use a float, we can also do that. Uh, we're gonna talk about float literals in a minute. Uh, but to do that, you have to initialize it a little bit differently. So let's change that variable to a double, and let's put some sort of value in it. A numeric value, Jeff, not something that has. And so you can see, I'm initializing a variable called x of type double. I'm assigning an initial value, and then the next thing I'm doing is I'm using our old friend system.out.println to show the value that that variable now has. All right? Um, this is a double. So let's try putting something in it like a character. So that's interesting that that works. We'll talk about why in a minute. You may wonder, this is sort of confusing. That looks like I've initialized the value of a double to a character, 
But there are definitely things I can put in here that will not work. Okay? So what, what we're actually using to initialize this particular variable is something that we refer to in Java as a literal, and in many, many other programming languages. So a variable can take on many different values throughout the course of your program, and that's why we use them. A literal takes on one value. It allows you to directly include a particular value in your code. And there's lots of reasons to do this. Sometimes you have, you know, you want a particular thing to run like 32 times. So you put the number 32 into your code. Or you have a, you know, particular value that you use as a threshold for determining whether or not, you know, it's warm outside or not. So you put that value into your code. In Java, we can declare literals of all the primitive types, and we can use them to initialize primitive variables, variables of primitive types. So there, there are some tricks for doing this. So for example, on line two, I have a variable of type long, and we'll talk about why it's called long in a minute. To initialize a long, I can't just set it to a thousand. I also have this suffix called L. And what that tells Java is that this literal, so the literal is over here on the right side of my expression that I'm using to initialize big is of type long. In Java, if you use single quotes around something, as I'm doing on line five to initialize my care called one, that is a character literal. So some of you may have seen this when you were trying to do the first homework, set of homework problems. You might have tried to use single quotes around your string and that will not work. In Java, a string, which consists of multiple characters, a string literal uses double quotes. A character literal, which is one character, uses single quotes. The true and false literals appear just like this in your code. So there are special values that you can use called true and false uh, that Java understands how to use. And, and those work the way that you would expect them to. So again, one of the reasons we use variables in our code as opposed to literals is that I can modify a variable. And this is the point where some of you that have come here with more of a math background may start to get a little confused. So when you solve an equation, a particular value, you know, is, is sort of takes on, uh, a, 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 like one of the variables in your equation takes on a value that's determined by the constraints of the problem. It doesn't change over time. In a computer program, once I initialize a variable, I can modify its value over and over and over again. And frequently, this is how we compute things using, using a computer. This is how computer algorithms work. You take a particular value, and I perform an iterative computation where I'm updating that variable uh, multiple times. So let's, let's do this little example here. So I have a, a variable of type int. I haven't printed anything yet, so the first thing I need to do here is add a print statement. Okay, so, so what happened to my variable here? On line two, I initialized it to 10. Then on line three, I changed its value to 20. Then I changed its value to 30. So you'll notice that when I set a variable, when I change its value, I can do math on the right side here. So I can set the value of changing to be 20 plus 10. Now there's an important thing that's, again, can be confusing to people that are new with, with, with programming, which is how this type of assignment gets done. So I wanna pause here and point this out. On line four, when I change the value of my variable called changing, here's what actually happens. The first thing that happens is the right side of that expression, sometimes called an R value, gets the computer computes what that is. So the first thing it does is compute whatever's on the right side. In this case, it's a sum. Remember, computers can do math. So I take 20 plus 10, I get 30. Then it assigns it to the variable on the left. So if you're, how many people are used to reading from left to right? Yeah, me too, right? Um, with computer code, when you look at assignments, you actually have to read from right to left. So you say, okay, what's happening on the right side of the equal sign? Then that variable gets assigned, that whatever happens there gets assigned to the left side. So on line four, I compute 20 plus 10, I assign that to the variable changing. 
We have some shorthand operators in Java for doing common manipulations of variables. So, uh, what do you think happens on line five? Anyone want to guess? Plus equals. Yeah. Exactly. So, this is a shorthand for writing the following. That's shorthand notation for this. You can also write this. So again, this is a great example, and if you're new to programming, we're gonna, we're gonna put some things like this on our homework problems, because this is the kind of thing you really need to be able to think through and understand. So let's talk about what happens when line five is executed. On, once I'm done with line four, what's the value of changing? 30, right? I think we can all agree on that. When line five starts executing, remember, I evaluate the right side first. So, what's the result of evaluating the right side of that expression? 31. The current value of changing is 30. I add 1 to it, and then I change the value of changing. So this is, you know, again, particularly if you, if, if you have a strong algebra background, this kind of thing just doesn't make any sense, right? How can changing equal changing plus 1? If that was on, you know, the, the math, you know, ACT part, you'd say that this is false, right? This can never be true. You know, a variable can never equal itself plus one. In computer code, it can. We do this all the time. And, and it's just because this is a different thing. We're taking the value of changing, we're modifying it on the right side, or we're computing an expression based on it on the right side, and then we're modifying. So, and I can, I can use, I can do arbitrary things with changing here. I could add it to itself twice. So here, I would start with 30, I would take 30 plus 30, which would be 60, I would add 1, and I would set that to the value of change. All right, same thing here, here's another piece of shorthand. This is shorthand, as you might expect, for dividing the value of changing. Oh, I can type, and then I'm gonna print the value. One other piece of mystery here. Is this right? There's something wrong here, right? I told you computers could do math. Did I lie? This computer just computed 61 divided by 2 and told me that the result was 30. Maybe this computer science thing isn't all it's cracked up to be. Why? Yeah. Right. Changing is of type integer. Integer values cannot store a decimal. And so when Java executes line six, what it does is it just tosses out that integer part. I want to be careful here because this is not rounding, all right? It is not being rounded. If it, if, if the correct answer was you know, 30.9, I would still get 30, because the fractional part is simply discarded. Because it's an int. Remember, I told Java, I'm only ever gonna store integer values in here. And so if I try to store something that's not an integer, um, it's, it's not going to happen. Okay. And this is because of the following facts. So throughout the life of a program, if I declare a variable as an integer, it has to retain that type. So what's gonna happen here? I on line two, I told Java I'm declaring a variable of type int, and I initialize it to 10. And then on line three, what am I trying to assign to it? What's on the right side of that expression? It's a literal, right? But it's a literal that has what? A decimal. So what's gonna happen here is that Java's gonna say, I can't do this. And there are rules about how these conversions get done that we'll talk about, but in general, Java will never allow you to do something like this. Because what it will do, it'll say, it will warn you. It'll be like, you know what, if you really wanted to store a floating point value, you need to make some changes to your code so that that variable can store a floating point value. Okay. Variables can be modified using other variables. So, in general, the right-hand side of a variable assignment statement can include other variables. It can include math. Uh, it can include other variables, do whatever you want. All of that right side is executed first, and then the value is assigned into the variable at the left side of the assignment expression. So, 
So here's another thing that trips people up when they start programming, which is on line three. So again, this is not equality. I'm not making an algebraic claim that first is equal to second. What I'm doing, this is assignment. I'm taking the value of second, and I'm assigning it to first. So whatever's on the right-hand side of this expression is going to become the value of first after the statement finishes executing. So let's put a print lin in here at the bottom and see what we got out of this. So first is 22, that's because it started at t as 10. Then I reassigned it to the value of second, which was five. These are doubles. Then I set it to second plus 10 after I had assigned second to 20, so now it's 30. Then I create a new double called third, which is two, and I say second plus third, first was second plus third, first was, oh, see, I'm, co I'm confusing myself. Whenever you get confused by something like this, just do what I'm doing and put another printf in. Ah, okay, gotcha. I set first equal to second, I set second to 20. So here first is five, then I assign it to the value of second plus 10. Second at that point is 20, second, first is second plus third, second is 10, third is two, first is 22. I think I got that right. The computer is right. I may be confused. All right, we have, we have a few more minutes today and I have a couple of announcements to get to at the end, so please don't start leaving. So what makes the Java primitive types primitive? Java has this really beautiful object system that we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this semester. And Java objects allow us to model and represent much more complicated things. So I can't store a picture in one of the Java primitive types, but I can create an object in Java that can allow me to store an entire photo. But so what makes these Java types primitive is that they can all be stored by the computer essentially as a single number, a single number in computer memory. You'll notice that almost all of them are numbers. I've got four different types of int, two different types of floating point, and I really only have those two other types that are kind of weird. One of them's a character, the other is a truth value. How do you th think I store truth values in the computer? What corresponds to the value true? Yeah. Right, true is one, false is zero. That's it, they're just numbers. What about the characters? How do I represent characters? I just said I have to represent these as a number. Oh, UTF-16, somebody is, is more modern than I am, right? So, so here it is. This is our first example of a convention, a representation convention. So the way that I store character values in Java, this is an old convention, somebody has a more modern approach to this that's better, but originally when I stored character values in Java, and Java characters can still only take 256 different values, this is the table of character values that we use. You'll see some familiar faces here, starting at 65 and going out to about 122. I have characters that you might recognize. It's the Latin alphabet. Over here on the right, starting at zero, I have some really random things. One of those values actually makes a bell on your terminal ring, right? This, the, this is an old standard. Um, what's missing here? Like, what's not on this list? If this was all the types of characters that I could represent, uh, who would be kind of sad about this? Like pretty much everybody on Earth, right? You know, uh, you know, most of the world cannot represent their text using this alphabet. And so one of the things we've done, there are new standards. There's something called UTF-8 and UTF-16 that can essentially represent almost an unlimited number of characters. In fact, I was reading something online that there are some uh, Japanese characters in the UTF standard that even experts in Japanese don't know what those characters are. They're apparently like, they snuck in there as a mistake, and now they're forever part of our character standard. There's some sort of like, you know, pictogram there that people are like, I don't, uh, that's not even a real thing. Like, someone just, maybe it was a joke, but someone just like snuck it in there. All right. Yeah. Oh, and we all have, yeah, so there's also plenty of space for emojis now in UTF-8. You can have upside down characters, it's great. So, okay. So this is our first I example, I just wanna make sure you understand, of a convention about how we represent the world. You guys are looking at another convention in lab this week about how we represent 
images. There's no law of the universe that says that the number 97 should represent the character A. Someone just wrote that down, and then we all agreed on it. And a lot of computer science you're gonna find works in that way. We come up with a standard, and then every computer that understands that standard uh, can communicate with each other. All right. I am going to come back to this. I'm gonna jump ahead to my announcements, and we'll pick up here on Friday. All right, so a couple of important announcements today, which is why I'm gonna uh, give them a little more time. So starting tomorrow, the, we're gonna run a session every week throughout the rest of the semester. It's called EMP. So the CS125, CS199, I think it's the official course number, EMP. As the name implies, this is a chance for you to get more practice. I have a fantastic set of CAs that are assigned to this section, and a fantastic section leader, uh, one of our TAs, Leah Butler. And this is what she does this semester. She doesn't teach labs, she teaches this section every week so that she can put time and energy into preparing it. If you are struggling, if you're one of the people that hasn't started the homework problems yet, if you're feeling lost and confused, I do not want you to drop this class. It's so important to me. When I see the enrollment numbers go down, I actually get really sad. Because, I mean, I take it personally. I'm like, is it me? Um, but I really want you to learn this stuff. I know that some of you, this isn't a perfect fit this semester, and that's okay, but I really don't want people dropping this class because they didn't think that they had enough support. This is one of the things we do. This is gonna be every Thursday night in Everett. It's a beautiful room if you haven't been in there yet. It'll be a lot of fun. You don't have to enroll. Simmer down, we're not done yet. You don't have to enroll to show up. You can just go. If there's a week where you're feeling a little bit behind and confused, go to EMP to get some extra help. Okay, a plea from me. After we're done in lecture, please don't like bum rush the stage. It does make me feel kind of cool, um, but I have a bunch of stuff to pack up and I'm here till 9.50, so if, if you're trying to talk to me, frequently what happens is like, I put something somewhere and I'll never find it again. I have lost like 10 of these little slide clicker tools um, because like I'm discombobulated. So let me pack up. If you wanna talk, I'll meet you on the steps today. Eventually, once it gets colder, we'll find another spot. If you're not enrolled in this class yet and you want, oh, 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 oh. If you're not enrolled in this class and you wanna take it, there should probably be seats opening up. Stay tuned. We have a homework problem out today. You have labs today. I will see you guys on Friday.